we are continuing our study of the book of Genesis. In our study of Genesis, we have come to chapters 6 through 8, where we are given an account of the great flood. In our last sermon, we began a study of the flood account by examining the first eight verses of chapter 6. In those first eight verses of chapter 6, we are told that during the age before the flood, Satan's fallen angels had sexual affairs with the daughters of men. And in doing so, their offspring polluted the human race with the genes of angels. Had this continued, the entire human race would have become polluted and there would not have been a person uh, left on earth who was a genuine human being. This would also have meant that there would not have been a genuinely human woman to bear the seed who would crush the head of Satan and set mankind free from sin and death. God responded to this situation by wiping out all of the polluted human beings on earth with the great flood of Noah. He also locked up in hell the angels who had the affairs with the daughters of men. So they couldn't do it again. This morning, we're going to continue our study of the flood by examining the historical reality of the flood. The historical reality of the flood. And the reason we're going to spend time examining the historical reality of the flood is because the reality of the flood has been rejected by most of the world's cultural elite. They've rejected it as being something that was impossible. Most of the world's cultural elite view Noah's flood as being a myth and a silly one at that. Unfortunately, when the cultural elite declares something to be impossible, Christians are often intimidated into believing that it's impossible as well. And even many of those Christians who refuse to be intimidated into rejecting the flood and insist on believing in the flood do so half-heartedly by believing that Noah's flood was a local flood and not a universal flood. Or maybe (laughs) they still believe that the flood was universal, but they don't talk about it very much. They find it embarrassing, preferring to have the whole subject of the flood relegated to their children's Sunday school classes. I don't know where each of you stands on the question of the flood, but I do know what I want this sermon to accomplish. I want this sermon to raise your belief in the flood to a wholehearted belief in the flood as opposed to a half-hearted belief in the flood. Now, the best place to start looking for hard evidence to support the reality of the flood is in the Bible, where we find that the Scriptures declare that the flood was real. And that that declaration begins with Genesis. The book of Genesis declares that the flood was real. I'll read a passage beginning in chapter 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I, God continued, am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. Not only does the book of Genesis declare that the flood was real, 
Isaiah and Jesus and Peter declared that the flood was real. The prophet Isaiah, for example, declared that the flood was real when he recorded God saying this to him in Isaiah 54. To me, this is like the days of Noah when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Jesus declared that the flood was real when he said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Peter declared that the flood was real when he wrote, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. And again, in 2 Peter 2, when he wrote, God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people. He protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. Not only do the scriptures declare the flood to be a reality, the scriptures declare that the flood was a universal flood as opposed to a local flood. By universal flood, we mean that the flood covered the entire earth as opposed to a small portion of it. There was a time when most Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, believed that the flood was universal and not real. But those times have passed. And they pass because more and more Christians have let the scientific community intimidate them into believing that the universal flood would have been impossible. And because of this, some Christians have embraced the idea that if there was a flood, it was a local flood. To those Christians who have let the scientific community convince them that a universal flood would have been impossible, I say, Shame on you. Shame on you. Don't ever let a bunch of men and women who live in laboratories tell you how to interpret God's Word. Don't ever do that, because the final authority in all matters of faith and practice and science is God's Word, not scientists. Furthermore, in spite of what you might have been told, evangelicals are Christians are not a bunch of dummies who know nothing about science. There are hundreds of thousands of evangelical Christians with bachelor's degrees in science and master's degrees in science and doctor's degrees in science. They staff the great universities of the world. So the idea that they're a bunch of educated, narrow-minded fools is absurd. I know the Washington Post wrote that several years ago easily coaxed into silliness, the Washington Post said. It shows how little the Washington Post knows. They can disagree with us, but to say that the evangelicals are but educated fools is simply not true. And most of these evangelicals with these degrees in science not only believe in the flood, they also believe that the final authority in all matters of faith, practice, and science is God's Word, not science. God's Word makes it clear that the flood was a universal flood, not a local flood. And we know this to be the case because the text itself, the text itself declares that the flood was universal. Let me read some excerpts from Genesis chapters 6 through 8, beginning in chapter 6. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. I'm going to put an end to all people. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath, the breath of life in it. Continuing. Everything on earth will perish. I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature. And all the high mountains under the entire heaven were covered. <coughs> the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. That's universal, folks. Every living thing <clears throat> that moved on the earth perished. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Now it's hard <clears throat> for me to understand how anyone can read these excerpts from Genesis chapter three, 6 through 8 and conclude that the flood was local. <clears throat> 
to conclude that the flood was local is to do great injustice to the text. The text itself declares that the flood was universal. And there's more. Not only does the text declare that the flood was universal, the need for the ark declares that the flood was universal. Let me explain. If the flood was local, why would God have Noah spend 120 years building a giant boat to save himself and his family and the animals? If the flood was local, Noah would only have needed to move a few hundred miles to higher ground. To do so, he could have, if it was a local flood, saved himself and the animals and his family. And furthermore, if the flood was local, why bother bringing animals into the ark? If the flood was local, the local animals would have died as they have died in local floods throughout history. But most of the world's animals, which are scattered throughout the earth, would have survived. So why bother trying to save one pair of each in the ark? A third reason for believing that the flood was universal is because of the covenant God made with Noah after the flood. That covenant declares that the flood was universal. Let me explain. Let me read the covenant first. Beginning in uh, Genesis chapter 9, I establish my covenant with you, speaking to Noah, God speaking to Noah, never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. The covenant God made with Noah and mankind after the flood declares that the flood was universal because God promised that nothing like this would ever happen again. But local floods have happened again and again and again throughout history. This means that if Noah's flood had been a local flood, then God has not kept his promise because there have been tens of thousands of local floods since the time of Noah. But God always keeps his promises. And what God was promising was that he would never again destroy the entire earth with a universal flood, and he has kept that promise. The historical reality of the flood is supported by the Scriptures. And the Scriptures also tell us that not only was the flood a reality, <clears throat> it was universal. Another reason <clears throat> for to believe in the reality of the flood is because the ark was more than large enough to carry all of the animals that needed to be carried. One of the major objections people have with the biblical story of Noah and the flood is that there are millions and millions of species of animals on the earth, and the ark was just too small to carry all of them. The problem with this objection is it's just not valid. And it's not valid because the ark was more than large enough to carry all the animals that needed to be carried. Let me explain. To begin with, <clears throat> the ark really was quite large. In fact, it was the largest boat ever built until a boat named the Great Eastern was built in 1858. This was the largest boat ever built prior to 1858. The ark measured 450 feet long by 75 feet wide by 45 feet high. Or if you will, it had a capacity of one and a half million cubic feet. Now, one and a half million cubic feet is a lot of cubic feet. But it's also a figure that means absolutely nothing to most of us because we can't imagine what one and a half million cubic feet are. So what let's do is try to break that down to something that we can understand a little bit better. And those figures are these. The ark had the, ark had the same capacity as 569 two-deck railroad cars. Two-deck railroad cars are the cars, railroad cars that carry livestock. And each of these railroad cars can carry 240 sheep per car. Hold on, you'll understand where we're going with this. <laughs> this means that the ark could carry a little more than 136,000 sheep. Now that's a lot of sheep. But the ark wasn't designed to carry just sheep. It was designed to carry all of the land animals that needed to escape the floodwaters. 
So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. How many animals did the ark need to carry? How many animals did the ark need to carry? We don't have the exact number, but we do have a pretty good approximation. And the approximate number is about 70,000 animals. Let me explain how we arrived at this number. Scientists have identified the existence of about one and a half million species of animals on the earth today. One and a half million species of animals. That's a lot of animals. But many of these animals didn't need to go into the ark. And many others were so small that they took up very little space. For example, about one million of our one and a half million species of animals are insects, all of which would fit nicely into a medium-sized closet. <laughs> and keep in mind, it was God who brought all the animals. They didn't have to go out and hustle a million insects. Can you imagine? God brought in what he wanted. So about one million of our one and a half million species of animals are insects, all of which would fit nicely into a medium-sized closet. So the insects took up very little space. And then there were the aquatic animals, like fish and mollusks, crustaceans, and other aquatic animals. These animals would not have needed to enter the ark. They would have survived just fine outside of the ark. So when the insects which would take up very little space, and the aquatic animals, which would have survived outside the ark, are subtracted from the total number of species. It's estimated, it's estimated that about 18,000 to 35,000 species of animals, such as birds and reptiles and mammals and amphibians, would have needed to enter the ark. Now, if we assume, for argument's sake, that the larger number of 35,000 species needed to be in the ark and double it because we need a male and female for each species, then the ark would have needed to hold about 70,000 animals at the most, at the most. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is this, could the ark have held 70,000 animals? The answer is yes, and it could have held even more. We've already shown, already shown that the ark could hold over 136,000 sheep. So it could easily, it easily have held the 70,000 animals that needed to come aboard. We also know that most of the animals that came aboard were smaller than sheep. And we know this to be the case because at least half of the species that came aboard were reptiles and birds, which were considerably smaller than sheep. And not only that, it is very probable that God brought baby animals aboard because he would have wanted them to live as long as possible so they could reproduce as long as possible. And remember this, again, God is the one who brought the animals aboard. So... Was the ark large enough to carry all of the animals it needed to carry? The answer is yes. Actually, only about 50 to 60 percent of the space in the ark was needed for the animals. The rest of the space could have been used for food and water, and there may not have even been a great need for food and water because, as some suggest, God may well have had the animals hibernate during the time they were in the ark to make it easier to care for them. We don't know, but it's highly possible. Keep in mind, God orchestrated this whole event. One of the most interesting reasons to believe in the reality of the flood is found in the histories and the legends of ancient civilizations throughout the world. The ancient civilizations declared that the flood was real and we should expect this to be the case if, in fact, the flood was real. After all, with the exception of Noah, and his family, the entire population of the world, was wiped out by the flood. Which means that all of the ancient civilizations sprang from Noah and his family after the flood. This being the case, we would expect to find stories of the flood included in the histories and the legends 
of the early civilizations as they spread throughout the world. And this is exactly what we find. The stories and legends of the flood are found in the ancient cultures of hundreds of tribes and nations throughout the world. The story of the flood is often distorted to be sure, but the essential truths are there. The oldest non-biblical account of the flood that we know about is found among the writings of the ancient Sumerians. The Sumerians lived in southern Mesopotamia, which is southern Iraq today. And in one of their cities, a city called Nippur, clay tablets were found, and on those clay tablets they recorded the flood story. Let me read to you a small portion of the Sumerians' flood story. Quote, When for seven days and seven nights the flood had raged over the land, and the huge boat had been tossed on the great waters by the storm. The sun god arose, shedding light in heaven and on earth. Susudra, Susudra was the, their version of Noah. Susudra made an opening in the side of the great ship. Before the sun god, he bowed his face to the ground. The king slaughtered an ox and sheep he sacrificed in great number. It's a reflection of what Noah did. Now, one of, the most famous, one of the most famous writings that spoke of the flood is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a story that was written on clay tablets and found by archaeologists in the 19th century when they were digging in Nineveh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is believed to have been written about 2000 B.C. That would be sometime during the lifetime of Abraham. And it tells the story of Gilgamesh, the king of Erech. Let me read a small portion of what they said. When the seventh day arrived, I sent forth and set free a dove. The dove went forth but came back. There was no resting place, and she turned round. Then I sent forth and set free a swallow. The swallow went forth but came back. There was no resting place for it, and she turned around. Then I sent forth and set free a raven. The raven went forth, and seeing that the waters had diminished, he circles, caws, and turns not around. Then I let out all to the four winds and offered a sacrifice. Distorted to be sure, but central elements are there. Now, as you would expect, some of the most complete flood stories are found in the ancient cultures of the Middle East where Noah and his family first settled. But flood stories are also found in ancient cultures throughout the world. Flood stories are found in the ancient cultures of India and China and the Pacific Islands and among the natives of North America and Central America and South America. Flood stories are also found in the ancient cultures of the British Isles and Western Europe and throughout Africa. Again, they are invariably distorted, but they're a question, unquestionably rooted in Noah's flood. For example, in India, the Hindus believe that the father of their race was a man named Manu. Manu was warned by a big fish of a coming flood and was told to build a boat on which he and seven others, for a total of eight, were saved from the flood. And the boat landed, in their, their legend, on the highest summit of the Himalayan mountains. Of course, they would pick a mountain in their neighborhood. <laughs> and then, after leaving the boat, the Indian legend reports that Manu got drunk and lay, lay naked until covered by two of his sons. The Hawaiians have a legend that in ancient times the world was very wicked, but there was one righteous man, a man named Nu'u. Nu'u built a great canoe. With a, notice how we adapt the stories to our own boats and our own mountains. I love it. Never underestimate the inventiveness of the human beings, particularly when it comes to distorting God's word. We're determined to do it. A man named Nu'u. Nu'u built a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with plants and animals. 
and escaped on it when the great flood came. The Alaskans, the Alaskan natives believed that the father of their ancestors had been warned in a dream of a coming flood. He built a raft, a raft on which he saved himself and his family and the animals. Their flood story has an interesting twist. In the Alaskan version, the animals who were able to talk before the flood complained so much about spending months on the raft that they were punished for complaining by losing their ability to speak after the flood. <laughs> I love that twist. I, I, I sort of, be honest with you, be perfectly honest, I'm sort of hoping there's an element of truth in it. Because I got some things I'd like to say some animals. Anyway, these are but a few of the hundreds of stories of the flood that are found in the histories and the legends of the earliest civilizations throughout the world. Believing in the flood is of particular importance. Let me repeat that. Believing in the flood is of particular importance. And it's of particular importance because in the history of man, there will have been two great judgments that God will have poured out on this earth. The first great judgment was Noah's flood. And that was a gigantic judgment. He wiped out everyone but eight human beings. And the second great judgment will be the seven-year tribulation that will precede Christ's second coming. The vast majority of men and women on the earth today simply do not believe in God's coming tribulation judgment. And while there are a number of reasons why they refuse to believe in the coming tribulation judgment, a major reason for refusing to, for refusing to believe in the coming judgment is because most men and women believe that God is much too loving to ever pour out a harsh judgment that would result in the deaths of hundreds of millions of men, women, and children. Most men and women simply believe, refuse to believe that God would ever do such a thing. If, however, these same men and women came to believe in the great flood, they would know better because much of the hard proof for the tribulation judgment to come is seen in the flood judgment of the past. A half-hearted belief in God's past judgments translates into a half-hearted belief in God's future judgments. But when men and women come to realize that God once destroyed the earth with a great flood, they're more likely to believe and prepare for the great judgment that will come. I pray that more and more men and women will do just that. Recognizing the reality of the flood will help them accept that coming judgment, and I pray they will and prepare for it. And there's only one preparation, and that's a refuge in Jesus Christ. Moses found refuge, excuse me, Noah found refuge in the ark, which is a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. He found refuge from God's wrath against sin. Well, God's going to be pouring out his wrath at the end of time, and there's only one refuge, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God. And I thank you for the refuge we have in Jesus Christ, a refuge that is certain and perfect and wonderful, a refuge that will prevent us from spending eternity in the ultimate judgment against sin. I pray, Father, that you would help every one of us recognize that judgment is coming and that we need to prepare for that judgment through faith in Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.